Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play this is my last letter, and here's the last thing I'll say. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hey, everybody. And we are here to wrap up the 1990s in the career of Joel Schumacher. Yes, my favorite decade. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not my favorite decade of his movies, but no. Yeah. <laughs> Just that's where the nostalgia is the strongest, I think, is yes. my biggest thing. Yeah. Well, and you and I are about the same age. So yeah, that's early to right. mid 90s, especially. <laughs> Late 90s, I just felt alienated and alone, <laughs> which was perfect because that was the theme. That's the, yeah, the teenage years for it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and just recap the films of the 1990s for Joel Schumacher. And again, we're coming yes. out of the 80s where he had a lot of moderately successful and, and well-regarded films, but he didn't have his yep. first number one hit until the 90s started with Flatliners, the Brat mm -hmm. Pack supernatural medical thriller. Yes. And looking back, what are your thoughts on Flatliners? Definitely not one of my favorites, but reasonably good. Better than the remake, which may not be saying <laughs> much. <laughs> But it's got a really great cast in there overall, and he did some interesting things with it, for sure. I think we wanted a little bit more, maybe. Yeah. But no, I think as it is, it's definitely one that's worth a revisit every now and then. Yeah, I personally think it is one of Joel's strongest films, even if it's not one of his deepest. I think that's the biggest mm -hmm. thing is I wish, and this will be kind of a recurring thing throughout this decade, is I just wish it had a little <laughs> more depth. Yeah. But I still like most of the cast, William Baldwin excluded. I love just visually how opulent mm -hmm. it is and how striking sure. it is and how, again, it's not about ghosts that are trying to kill you. It's literally about you having to face your own guilt and how everyone had their own individual hauntings. And there was an intelligence to the story, even if it wasn't as thematically rich as I hoped it could be. Mm -hmm. But I still think coming out of the gate, that's a good one to start the decade off with. Absolutely. And it's one I definitely still recommend. I can see why it became the hit that it was. Mm -hmm. And then following that hit with not a hit, Ugh. we had Dying Young. Yeah. What are your thoughts looking back on Dying Young? Ugh. That's about <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if I wouldn't know what was next, I would have an even more dramatic one. It's just not a good written story. Mm. Julia Roberts is trying, but even she seems baffled with, am I supposed to like this guy? Because yeah. like all of her body language through the whole movie is like, Ugh, get away from me. Yeah, just not a good love story. No. Some really problematic things in there. He's not a good sympathetic protagonist or whatever he's supposed to be. He's just, ugh, ugh. Yeah, I really enjoyed one sequence in that, and that was that chemotherapy sequence, because it was so mm. visceral and so well-crafted in terms of exploring just what that does to a person. Right. That's the only thing that I liked. <laughs> I mean, again, it's his character is bad. The romance is just so depressingly toxic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the film just like halfway through it suddenly yanks to a completely different setting. It never really goes anywhere. It doesn't even really resolve at the end. No. There's that whole like romantic triangle almost that kind of happens. But not well done. No. Yeah. And apparently a lot of it got cut out. Right. It's a film that I know had a lot of production woes and Joel's heart wasn't fully into it. Mm -hmm. But but still, ultimately, it's just not a good film. It's just kind no. of a sad mess of a train wreck. Yep. And speaking of a sad mess of a train wreck. <laughs> Indeed. We follow that up with the television series 2000 Malibu Road, for which Joel directed every single episode. I can't remember if it was six or seven episodes, but it wasn't long. No. And looking back, what are your memories of 2000 Malibu Road? Honey Bunny? Honey. Honey Bunny. <laughs> That's my main memory. Now. Oh, God. Oh, just really bad, bad soap opery television. Just no, bad, 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 bad. I feel really bad for Drew Barrymore yeah. to even be in this thing. It was an interesting cast, sort of, mm -hmm. but the characters were bad. The scripts were just trashy and sloppy as hell. Mm -hmm. Like, I keep thinking back on that mistimed action motorcycle crash. <laughs> <laughs> God. Yeah. 
I think Joel directing a sexy soap opera thriller in the early 90s sounds like an interesting idea, but he was just paired with really bad material. Mm -hmm. That was not a well-written series. And even the premise is just such a basic three women share a house. Here's the drama of their lives. Right. I think technically four. Four women share a house. But you've probably forgotten all about Jennifer Beale. There were only three story (laughs) threads among the four. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And then it became this weird satire where the psychic voodoo agent who hates and loves her sister infiltrates the Hollywood industry by setting herself upon this one executive, and it got weird. And was the rapist an evil twin or a split personality? The world will never never know. know. Does anyone care? No. But you can see a doctor (laughs) to find out if you had a voodoo curse put on your penis. (laughs) It's true. We learned that. My doctor says, it's like, I want to see that prescription for him, you know? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's no other cause for your impotence, sir. It's a voodoo curse. It was the stupidest goddamn show. It really was. Well, and then rising out of that, then we got falling down. Yeah, what a 180 there. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so what are your thoughts <laughs> on falling down? I don't know why I'm having a harder time. It's like, I certainly remember it. Jack and I frequently do the think about it. <laughs> A lot. (laughs) Partially because there's a quote in Wonder Years where his older brother's about to tackle him and he goes, think about it. (laughs) Now we do think about it. Think about it. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, yeah, I think I'm thinking about it. It's all coming back to me. Falling Down is a very powerful film. It's very well done. The biggest sort of flaw it has is that I don't think it always makes absolutely clear that he is the villain of the piece. That Nazi guy is a worse person, for sure, but what he is doing is not okay, and I don't feel like he appropriately is scolded or scorned or punished for his actions. He ultimately gets away with it in the end. That's the major, I guess, flaw. But as a character study, it is a very great film. See, my thing is, I think they're contrasting where it's taking Mm -hmm. times where, yes, I can relate to you and your frustrations here and contrasting Mm -hmm. it against, whoa, dude, back the truck up. Right. Like there are people that I work with who are like super ideologically opposed to me and there are still moments that I could find that I relate to them. Mm -hmm. And then that even stands in sharper contrast to the moments where I'm like, holy shitballs, what's wrong with you? (laughs) I like that humanity to him of that. He's not entirely a bad guy, but he's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. You know? It's not really making me sympathize with him, even though I'm empathizing with moments of situations they find themselves in, even as he's digging his own grave. Yeah, I feel like there just aren't quite enough of those woe moments. Yeah, but still, I think it's a really sharp script. I think it balances the darkness with the satire well. Mm -hmm. I think Joel directs the hell out of it. It's a film of sequences, and I love a lot of the sequences. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, I think, another one of his really strong films, but I think it's also one of those ones where Joel, again, can be very driven by the material on the page. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you give him a really solid script, there's a good chance he'll make a really solid movie out of it. And if you give him a really bad script, he'll make it look nice and give some good performances, but he's going to struggle. And even if you're giving Mm -hmm. him his own script, (laughs) (laughs) you know, you don't always know what you're going to get. Yeah. I think Falling Down is one of those ones where I wish we had more films like that in Joel's career. Mm -hmm. We will get a few more. Yeah. I think like Flatliners and that in the first half of the decade are two of the strongest films of the decade. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a shame that he never quite hits those notes again. Yeah. And then that's what begins the four film series with Akiva Goldsman writing and Warner Brothers (laughs) producing with John Grisham's The Client. And what are your thoughts looking back on The Client? Uh... It wasn't awful. I feel like it was like very serviceable and in a lot of ways kind of forgettable. I remember Mm -hmm. who was in it. I remember the story, but I'm having a hard time having any feelings thinking about it at this point. I played the fifth. (laughs) It has a special place for me because it was the first Joel Schumacher film I saw in theaters and I saw it as a kid Mm -hmm. when I was around the same age as the kid in the movie. It's not one of the best John Grisham thrillers. I think even the book Mm -mm. had a problem where it was a great setup, but then they never really quite knew where to go after the great setup. And so it just kind of wanders and then has the bad ending in the boathouse. Right. And the movie suffers from that too, where it's a great setup and there's great acting, some really good characters. Mm -hmm. He shoots it well. It's well done. But just as the story goes along, it kind of loses its momentum, wanders around, and then there's the boathouse. Yeah. Yeah. I still enjoy it. I think it's still a good Saturday afternoon on TV 
movie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's one that I was really looking forward to. And now in hindsight, I'm kind of like, yeah, it was okay. (laughs) Right. It's such a generic name, too. Like, I get that, you know, yeah, it's the focus is on the kid. The firm. But, right, exactly. The chamber. (laughs) Exactly. It's time to kill. Day, like, we're like, which one is this one again? Like a time to kill at least kind of hints at its themes and we'll get there. But the client, okay. Well, one of his novels is The House. <laughs> is it a haunted house? Because otherwise, what's the point? It's actually, I think, just like a quiet countryside thing with someone reminiscing about their home. Okay. It's not even a thriller. Well, I guess that's why it doesn't have an adjective in front of it. The House. <laughs> John Grisham's The Book. (laughs) And you know people would buy it, too. Yes. Is it a book of law? It's the book. I gotta see what it's about. I have to read it. That would be a cool thing is like if we had one year where like John Grisham, Stephen (laughs) King, get a bunch of like the top paperback, like Jeffrey Deaver, Mm -hmm. get some of the big writers, James Patterson, and every one of them puts out a book titled The Book. The Book. (laughs) And they're differentiated by Stephen King's The Book, Jeffrey Deaver's The Book, John Grisham's (laughs) The Book, and they all do their own completely different thing. It just has to be called The Book. Wait, can we also have John Carpenter's The Movie? (laughs) (laughs) Wes Craven can't do one, obviously, but you know, like, all of those, like, artists. John Carpenter's horror film. (laughs) That would be a thing, yeah. You're buying the name anyway. It's fine. You'll do it. I bet we could get Spielberg on board. Oh, yeah. Steven Spielberg's The Movie. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Martin Scorsese's The Movie. Absolutely. Which is basically Hugo. (laughs) Anyways... So taking a complete 180 from the client, this is when we get to Joel Schumacher taking over the Batman film franchise Yes, with Batman Forever. The reason we're here, sort of, kind of. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Thankfully, we have moved beyond. I'm just waiting for that phrase that you expect me to say, and I'm not going to. (laughs) What are your thoughts looking back on Batman Forever? I will still defend this movie. I'm not saying it's great. It's not a masterpiece of cinema. It's not the strongest Batman film. It's not the best version of Batman by a mile. But it's fun. I still like it. It's very silly. It's cheesy. But I find it entertaining. And it's glitzy and the costumes and the colors and the sets. And it's a load of fun for me. I know there's issues, but I still like it. I don't click with it as much. Again, I don't have a problem with the camp, with the aesthetic, with the sets Mm -hmm. and costumes. I don't even have a problem with the way that Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones are going over the top. I have issues with the story and with their characters, Mm -hmm. but on a pure visual aesthetic level, I'm fine with going as big and bold as you want. Mm -hmm. My issues are, again, the script is just a complete mess, Mm -hmm. even before Akiva, to clarify. It doesn't do a good job of pulling all the elements together. It tries to do darker thematic stuff and then not actually construct a story that supports that darker thematic stuff. And I think Val Kilmer is trying to play a serious brooding Batman in a film that is so colorful that it just makes him look flat. Sure. I don't hate it for the reasons that a lot of other people hate it. I don't care about the nipples. I don't care about the statues (laughs) and the neon black light. Mm. In fact, I actually care about that stuff because it's interesting. It's visually dynamic. It has a consistency to that world. I am perfectly on board with doing a Batman film of that aesthetic. I just don't think the story was good. I don't think the character studies were good. I don't think the humor was well written and it lacked wit. I do think Robin was good. I think the strongest thing about that was Robin and his story Mm -hmm. arc and Chris O'Donnell as Robin. Yep. Yeah, he's a Robin in his 20s. I don't care. It was still well executed and he seemed fully on board with the tone of the movie. Mm -hmm. And goddamn, is he cute with that haircut. (laughs) And then that brings us to The Babysitter. Uh, which was written and directed by Guy Furland, who was previously Joel's longtime personal assistant. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing Joel produced it as a favor. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts looking back on The Babysitter? Not John Grisham's The Babysitter. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so badly written. It's a bunch of people creeping after Alicia Silverstone. Just gross and really bad and not entertainingly bad. Just... Just stay away. (laughs) It's an interesting concept of this pretty young teenage girl who's a babysitter and exploring how all of the men around her fetishize her and fantasize about her Mm -hmm. and how when they all finally decide to act out that fantasy, they all collide and violence erupts and everything goes bad. 
it's an interesting concept and I could see why that short story from I want to say the 40s or 50s has lingered and a lot of people are fascinated by it Mm. but the film is just so cheaply and trashly made yeah like that's something I would really love to see like a really interesting intellectual character piece of really well-made film maybe by a woman (laughs) right exploring how women are fetishized by the men around them Mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to look at it's just a really cheap and trashy movie Yeah, that's not what this movie is at all. Yeah, it's trying to be something interesting and bold, and it's just very sloppy and clumsy. Yep. Definitely not a recommend for The Babysitter. Mm -mm. And then that brings us to John Grisham's A Time to Kill. Yes, which like I said, the title at least gives you an idea what it's about, and I appreciate that. It's about killing and what time (laughs) you can do so. When is killing okay? Yeah. And that's sort of my one argument with the film is that I don't necessarily agree with that idea, particularly when you've got somebody like John Grisham who is writing so focused on the law and you have a lawyer who has pre-knowledge of the crime before it Mm. happens and then goes on to defend the person. That's you're already problematic. But, you know, as far as the emotion of the material and that dramatic story, Schumacher does a really great job with it. There's still some problems here and there. I seem to recall that Sandra Bullock's character was not handled particularly well. No, not terribly, but not well, yeah. Yeah, like just not quite as strong as she probably should have been. But overall, it is a good movie and it's worth watching, but it's just got a couple little things here and there that are, you know, and also, you know, Kevin Spacey warning. Yeah. (laughs) Make of it what you will. I think it's a really good film. It's a good story that has a lot to say about the themes that it's exploring. It actually does dig more deeply into those themes Mm -hmm. than some of Joel's other films. Yeah. I think it's beautifully shot and directed especially the way they involve the heat of the setting. Mm -hmm. I think the cast is great. I think, yeah, it's like when you ultimately come down to what is the ultimate endpoint message, Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it gets complicated. And it's like, I see where you're coming from, but Mm -hmm. I don't entirely agree with it, which again, I find interesting in that it's challenging in that I could see that verdict actually happening and I could see situations where it wouldn't, you know, and I like Mm -hmm. that because it sparks interesting discussion and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I do think of the four screenplays by Akiva Goldsman (laughs) that I read for this, it was the strongest, not Mm -hmm. just because he stuck to the book, even scenes that he added were not bad scenes. I absolutely will give him kudos and credit for that. And I think it's a good, strong film. I think it's one of those films you watch it. This is definitely trying to be your Oscar-y type of big discussion movie of the year. And it fits that. It's worthy of that, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then we get Batman and Robin. Can we just like basically pitch shift our opinions from Batman Forever? And that way my opinion will be your opinion and your opinion will be my opinion because that's kind of what happens with this one. I don't mind the nipples. I don't mind the costumes and the cheesiness. I have a big problem with the tone of the story. You can't have Alfred is dying at the same time as you have Mr. Freeze barrage of puns. Uh, and take, take two of these <laughs> and call me in the morning. Uh. It's, you know, the <laughs> there's just way too many. Like the story is not well written. Batgirl has absolutely nothing to do. She is that strong female character with scare quotes in the worst way. It's a lot of story elements like that that really ultimately bother me. And I just can't accept this film as a good fun time. And I'm like, it's stupid silliness, but it knows it's stupid silliness. And is just as big and colorful of stupid silliness as it can be. And (laughs) again, it's like, it's weird. It's like, I'm giving it points for not trying. (laughs) It's not trying to be a complicated... It's it's literally the simplest of stories. Villain A, villain B, they fight, they team up, heroes have to stop them. It's the simplest goddamn story. I want to steal all the diamonds so I can make a freeze ray. Well, I want to make everything plants. What if we work together, but we're secretly opposed? It's not complicated at all. And it's not even trying to be. And it's all just about big, colorful, aesthetic, balloon, neon things. See, I disagree on trying to be, because like I said, you've got this Mr. Freeze and his wife tragic and Alfred dying. And then you've got the moments of Bruce and Alfred and they're not talking about it. No, it does try to be more. And it's like, no, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I'm sorry. You just can't. 
Where I would disagree is that those are just brief moments, whereas in Batman Forever, it's like they're trying to frame an entire story around duality, but not succeeding. This one, it's literally like Alfred's sick. And that's the level of depth of his dying. Yeah, but they come back to it like three or four times. I mean, it's not like it's just one moment and done. It's a recurring thing. But it's not deeply layered into the story. And even again with Freeze and his wife, I like that, yeah, you get the moment of him in the cell with the little sculpture music box, which they took straight from the animated series. And I like Mm -hmm. that the movie ends with one of the best Batman moments ever of instead of like killing the villain or arresting the villain, he inspires the villain to do the right thing. And I want more Batman stories that do that. Except for the part where he then goes and kills Poison Ivy in Arkham Asylum. So (laughs) we don't know that he kills her. He's, you know, oh, come on. No, he just gives her like daily noogies, you know, (laughs) he's there to make her life a living frozen hell, you know. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Rumi, that's where you hit on the Akiva Goldsman things. It's like, you got a moment there, but you didn't think about the broader implications. Right. And no, I fully agree. It's not a well-written movie at all. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just saying that it's not trying to do anything complicated. Fair enough. And I, again, I don't really like the movie that much either, but just as like a big colorful train ride, I'm like, okay, this is fun. (laughs) You know, it's not conflicted. It doesn't feel conflicted. Yeah. I still agree that none of the humor has any actual wit to it. (laughs) No, it does not. Most of the jokes don't land. Take two of these. If any Batman film (laughs) needed a Dan Waters rewrite. Oh God, yes. And Dan Waters would make it just as silly and dumb as this is. Absolutely. But it would be sharp and witty dumb. Exactly. Like I literally just showed a friend Ford Fairlane for the first time and that movie's just as dumb as Batman and Robin, (laughs) but there's a wit to it. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. It's not good. But I think people hate the Batman movies for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. They latch on to the aesthetic. They latch on to the gayness. They latch on to just how big and silly things are. The problem isn't that it's big and silly. It's that it's stupidly big and silly. Mm-hmm. It lacks wit. And again, like Batman Forever, it's trying to do something thematic without actually having any thematic cohesion or depth. Yeah. And that's its biggest difference from yeah. the 60s show as well. Yeah. Yeah. And again, Batman and Robin, I'm not arguing it's good. But I at least enjoy the experience of watching it more than I do Batman Forever. Mm -hmm. Because it's at least more consistently just big, goofy fun. (laughs) That is our final word on Joel Schumacher's (laughs) involvement with Batman. We'll never bring it up again. We'll never bring it. No. Actually, I don't really see a reason why we would need to. (laughs) I'm sure if we want to make comparisons or something, but there's probably not a whole lot left in terms of flashiness. Yeah, I'm not going to bring up his third Batman movie at the end because we already brought that up in Batman and Robin. The script Mm -hmm. has never come out. We don't actually have anything to look at. Yeah. If that script ever did come out, we would absolutely (laughs) take a look at it. Otherwise, we are moving beyond (laughs) fill in the blank. Blank, blank, blank. (laughs) Yes. Anyways, then that brings us to, there was a period there of frustration where the reception of Batman and Robin didn't really go so well, but he went, like what he usually does, hard 180, Mm -hmm. and did the lean gritty thriller 8mm. And what are your thoughts looking back on 8mm? 8mm is a weird one. I thought of this one a little more fondly, and then I watched it again, and I was like, hmm, not as good as I thought it was. I mean, there's some strong performances in here. But it doesn't quite come together as tightly as you want it to, I think. It could be a much better film than it is. Yeah. Again, he started with a really strong script. It has a good story. It has some good threads to it, good performances. But I think direction-wise, he's pulling himself back and restraining himself too much. So the film is just kind Mm -hmm. of flat. Yeah. It doesn't have energy or bite to it. Mm -hmm. Even though it's filming material that had energy and bite, it's just kind of listless. Yeah. And it's not a bad movie. I think if you're curious to check it out, go check it out. But it's Mm -hmm. not one that's like a highlight. Like, Falling Down had this energy and had this bite to it. And this one, Mm -hmm. it just doesn't. It's just very quietly presenting everything. Mm -hmm. Even though it's this really gritty, dirty story. Dark (laughs) material, right? Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's like, I wish that if he had taken more like the shooting style that he had in, we'll get to Flawless in a second, but in that, or even Mm -hmm. the music video we watched, if it had been a little more manic, a little more frenetic, Mm -hmm. it would have had something that pulled you into that world a little better. Yeah. Yeah. And then speaking of, he ended the decade with Flawless, his first original script in almost 15 years. Yeah. 
This one just really did not click with me at all. I mean, I guess there were some moments here and there. The tone of it just felt a little off. I think, you know, we had both talked about if he had leaned into making this an ensemble of characters in their lives, it probably would have worked a little better. But focusing on these two and particularly Robert De Niro's character doesn't quite work because I just don't have enough sympathy for him as a character. I don't feel like he learns enough. And yeah, it's not what I feel like the movie could be in terms of trying to create this sort of uplifting story of people finding their similarities and their differences. Yeah, my thing, I don't dislike the movie, but it is too fleeting. Mm-hmm. It feels too underdeveloped, undercooked. It doesn't feel cohesive enough. It doesn't feel deep enough. It feels like a good first draft that they unfortunately just filmed the first draft instead of continuing to develop it more. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that was just, you know, Joel was rusty or he had to rush into production or something. I don't know. I like the yeah. central performances. Mm-hmm. I like a lot of individual scenes in it. I like the way that it's shot and directed. But yeah, just story-wise, it just doesn't all come together. Again, it's not mm-hmm. offensively so. It would still rather watch this than Dying Young again. Yeah. There's an energy to it and a fun to it and a heart to it, but it needed to cook longer before they actually went out and shot it. Mm-hmm. It's not a terrible note to end a decade on. Mm. What are your thoughts overall on Joel Schumacher's run in the 90s? It is a little, I guess, sad is the good word, you know, because I feel like he started out really well with Flatliners. Dying Young was a misstep, but Falling Down was really strong. And it starts heading downward from there, unfortunately, and then ends with these little, "Mm, well, that's okay, you know. I'm hoping that this is all just sort of the failures, particularly Batman and Robin, hurting his spirit a little bit. And maybe we're going to see a little return once we get into the 2000s. Maybe he'll start to find his groove again and his confidence. Yeah, it's a very, very mixed year. He's got some really strong stuff, but he's also got some really weak stuff. Yeah, it's very hit and miss. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing about the 80s was it was only like six movies, but they were all six Mm -hmm. very different movies. Right. And even if we didn't fully recommend them, it's like he was doing really interesting stuff in them. Mm -hmm. I didn't hate any of them. I think the one I liked the least was St. Elmo's Fire, and I still didn't hate that movie. It just, it was an interesting movie. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the 90s is just... (laughs) It's like watching a heartbeat go to flatline, you know, it's like high, low, high, low, dot. And yeah, it's like once you hit the Batman films, as much as I don't want to completely identify Joel's career with the Batman movies, Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of discussion about him does so, I do feel that is where things changed. I feel that then became a definition that he very strongly tried to run away from. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a myth that he apologizes and regrets everything from it, that's not true. I think it definitely branded him in a way that he's Mm -hmm. tried to escape. Sure. And I just don't think he was being offered the same material that he had been before. I don't think Mm -hmm. he had the same pull in the industry that he had before. So it'd be harder to get budgets. It would be harder to get the stories that he wanted, harder to get the actors that he wanted. I mean, we definitely have not seen our last good Joel Schumacher movie. Right. And even then, I don't say Flawless and 8mm are bad. They're very midline. Mm -hmm. I don't really recommend or not recommend. They're just kind of there. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have more films like that, where it's like, this could be something more than what it is. And he's Uh now running into limitations on how well he can make things. Sure. I think once we get past Fan of the Opera, especially, which I still haven't seen and I'm still curious about, we're never going to see anything as opulent as that or as Flatliners was. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we're going to see scripts coming in that are as strong as some of the ones that he was getting. Probably not. It was a frustrating decade where we got some really good stuff and we got some really bad stuff and a lot of stuff that just kind of works and kind of doesn't. Mm-hmm. It's been interesting seeing the visual development. He was still very good at how he used color, Mm -hmm. even setting aside the Batman films where it's like all color. But even stuff like, you know, Falling Down, where it's the heat wave is just very soft, very salmon. And otherwise, you still have your blues. You still have your reds. Mm -hmm. You have the colorful sequence in the fast food joint, you know, or you had Flatliners, which was very operatically lit and colored. Mm -hmm. But then as you get into like 8 millimeter and Flawless, and then even thinking about the films of the 2000s, this is where we start to get everything has to be muted to certain color schemes. Yeah, the digital color editing. Which started to become a huge thing, where it's basically the return of sepia tone or everything is mm-hmm. green everything is blue everything is orange and brown right i want joel with color mm-hmm. do you have any thoughts on that of how he was as a filmmaker through this 
I think it's kind of the same, right? Yeah. Like there's some really fun moments there when he does get the chance. But yeah, there's also a lot of them where it's okay. He's just not bringing a whole lot to it yeah. sometimes. You know, I think it's that mix. I don't know. I kind of liked that with Lost Boys and Flatliners where every sequence was kind of its own sequence and had its own little style and the way that it was lit and the way it was shot. Mm -hmm. But then you run into problems with like Dying Young where, again, it's like you have the chemotherapy sequence and the getting lost in the maze sequence where it's mm -hmm. very in your face, handheld, wide angle lens shot very much like the flatlining sequences in Flatliners. Mm -hmm. But then the rest of it is just like this very distant flat zoom lens yep. style. Yep. And 8mm is very very just that kind of flat zoom lens style. Mm -hmm. And then you get the flawless and it's right back to gritty handheld in the moment on the street. I like that he's playing with the styles, but it mm -hmm. doesn't always feel like it's being applied to the right moment. No. Yeah, Shumacast, we only got one more decade to go. I guess technically a little bit one and a half. Yeah, you know, counting it all in the same because he just kind of stopped. <laughs> <laughs> We'll you know, I'm just saying 2010 starts a new decade. 10 I know, but we don't have a full decade after that, so we're looping it in. No, we don't. We are now basically two thirds of the way through this project because the 70s and the 80s were so short. They were like the mm -hmm. first third and then this has been like the big middle third. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. Before we start wrapping up with final thoughts, let me just run through. We had a few films that Joel almost directed. Mm -hmm. So let's start with The Devil's Advocate, which was a novel by Andrew Niederman, who Andrew Niederman is probably best known as, or probably best unknown as, the guy who wrote the majority <laughs> of V.C. Andrews novels. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's the author who took over in the late 80s after she passed away suddenly. Gotcha. And he has been writing all of them since. He wrote more V.C. Andrews novels than V.C. Andrews. <laughs> yeah. He's written some of his own, like Devil's Advocate was one of his own. He had this one novel called Pin, which was adapted as a really big thriller in the 90s, too. I think the original novel came out in the mid-80s and just kind of floated around Hollywood for a while. Joel was involved in 1994, kind of more of a flatliners -y adaptation from what I hear, where it's very opulent, mm. operatic. I know he had like a whole big sequence where someone was going to descend through the New York subway system, like descending through the levels of Dante's Inferno. Okay. Brad Pitt was signed on to star. And the biggest issue was he was never able to get an actor locked down to play the devil. Hmm. Al Pacino was actually on and off, on and off, on and off. He was never able to get him to sign it. They got to a point where they were already booking locations and they couldn't get an actor to stick. And they ultimately just shut it down and moved on. Hmm. Okay. And then that was when he went in and started working on Batman Forever. Hmm. Some interesting stuff was that Nicolas Cage was actually on board for a supporting role, which ultimately was cut from the finished film. Okay. And it was ultimately released in 1997, written and directed by Taylor Hackford. And it's the story of an attorney who gets hired to a firm where people who are guilty of crimes always get away with it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to actually be run by the devil. Right. And have you seen Devil's Advocate? Yes, it has been a very long time, but my beloved Keanu is in it. So. Angie, have you seen a Keanu Reeves <laughs> film starring Keanu Reeves? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> You know, it's one of those that I'm almost a little scared to revisit because I don't know. Like, I remember enjoying it at the time, but I also remember it being a little odd, to say the least, because he is literally the devil. I seem to recall it gets a little weird and it's a yeah. question of, you know, how well executed are those scenes? I would imagine Pacino's performance probably still at least somewhat holds mm -hmm. up and that he's intentionally going over the top. Keanu is Keanu, so, <laughs> you know, I can't have an official opinion. I'm biased. It's probably been a good 10, maybe 15 years since I've seen it. Well, I'll say it holds up. Okay. I think the biggest thing is that the plot goes everywhere you expect it to. Mm -hmm. There's no real surprises to the plot, but it is very well directed. It is very sharply written. The cast is really great. And I love Keanu too, but he's one of those actors who I don't think is always put in the roles that fit him. Right. Because he's an actor who has a very specific range. Mm -hmm. It's always interesting when you see him try to break past that range, but it doesn't always work. Dracula. Yeah. But I really liked him here because he was this very flamboyant, cocky, southern lawyer. And so it's Keanu with a southern <laughs> accent. Yeah. But he actually, it wasn't a bad accent and it wasn't overplayed. He was very energetic and expressive, which is always fun to see when he gets to be that way. Mm. I thought Pacino was great. This was one of Charlie Theron's big breakout roles as his mm -hmm. wife. Connie Nielsen had a really great role. It was a really well put together movie. 
And it's one of those ones where the script had gotten to a very different place by the time it was made than when Joel was working on it. And sadly, I don't have any drafts from when Joel was on board. Mm -hmm. I could see Joel doing something really interesting with that story especially if he was going to do something more along the lines of how Flatliners was directed, of like how it's reality right. that bleeds into surreality mm -hmm. and with a lot of big gothic horror imagery. and Yeah, a little more dark and moody. Yeah. I would be very curious to see what that descending into Dante's subway system would have been like. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely one of those ones I don't think would have been a bad fit for Joel. Mm -hmm. And then the next one was Runaway Jury, which was another John Grisham novel. It was set to start immediately after Batman and Robin. Edward Norton and Sean Connery were already signed to star. Hmm. And this would have been like the fifth film he would have done in a row with Warner Brothers, where it'd be John Grisham, Batman, John Grisham, Batman, John Grisham. <laughs> and then he was going to do another Batman, too. Mm -hmm. In June of 1997, while Joel was still in Tokyo promoting Batman and Robin, Sean Connery backed out because his schedule was too uh. full. And then so in August, Joel, he even gets into this on the commentary for Batman and Robin. He was just so burned out mm. with doing all for like client batman time to kill batman all back to back sure and then also just with the reception and the fallout of batman and robin and all that stuff since production was halting he just took the opportunity to back out and go on vacation in mexico for i think like three months <laughs> and then they had to pay off edward norton who had a pay or play contract oh wow it wasn't made for several more years it came out in 2003 it was directed by Gary Fleeter, primarily a TV director, though he did mm. the films Kiss the Girls and Don't Say a Word. Okay. Among the four accredited screenwriters, and I believe this does overlap with when Joel was involved, one of the screenwriters is Matthew Chapman, the guy who wrote and directed Slow Burn. Oh, okay. And Runaway Jury is, you remember that sequence at a time to kill where it's all about the mechanics of how a jury is selected and how mm. you try to get a jury selected in your favor? Right. It's getting even deeper into that where you have this older figure who was Sean Connery and ultimately ended up being played by Gene Hackman, who runs this technically illegal company that will basically vet jurors, like basically identify everyone who is in the jury selection pool and start manipulating mm. them to either back out or get deselected or basically rigging the jury. Wow, okay. And then one juror who they don't know who it is suddenly offers both sides for a million dollars, I'll give you the winning vote. Hmm. And it turns out that that character who was going to be Edward Norton but actually is John Cusack, he's hmm. not actually trying to rig the jury. He's trying to systematically, just through interactions with the jurors, undo all of the rigging. Okay. Basically counter manipulate the jury from the inside. Huh. And it's not even to win the case in either way. It's just to literally get all the jurors to vote with their conscience. Mm -hmm. So it's just really kind of fascinating head game. It's not a super intelligent movie. It's like on the level of <laughs> Don't Say a Word or Kiss the Girls. It's a pretty typical Grisham thriller, but it's not a bad one. Good movie mm -hmm. to watch. And I think Joel would have done a perfectly fine job with it, too. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. It seems like it's all about the execution of it as whether it's truly interesting to watch or not. And it's kind of like a thriller version of 12 Angry Men, which I don't think mm -hmm. people get is the ultimate thriller, where there is no massive plot. <laughs> it's just 12 people in a room trying to agree. Yeah. <laughs> It's a little silly, but it's not a bad movie. And I would like to have seen what Joel's version would have been like. Mm -hmm. And then we get to Dreamgirls, mm -hmm. which was a 1981 play, basically a fictionalized version of the rise of Motown built around a Supreme style group. It was going to be the film debut of Whitney Houston. Wow. But they backed out because she insisted on singing the songs of both sisters. That would be a little weird. Okay. Exactly. exactly. So they would have had to completely rewrite it. And the producer yeah. of the play was still tied up in the rights. The producer of the play ultimately became one of the heads of DreamWorks. Oh, okay. So that's how he got to stay involved with it. Joel in the 90s spent two years developing it. Okay. He was working with a screenplay by Tina Andrews, who was an actress who ultimately didn't have a screenplay produced until after this. It was Why Do Fools Fall in Love? Mm -hmm. Lauren Hill and Don Cheadle were in talks to star. This was going to be Lauren Hill's big film debut. Mm -hmm. It was ultimately canceled by Warner Brothers in October of 1998 because they were still a little miffed at him pulling out a runaway jury, which cost them a lot of money having to pay Edward Norton off. Mm -hmm. They were still dealing with the fallback of Batman and Robin. Mm -hmm. Why Do Fools Fall in Love ultimately did come out in that time and bombed. Mm -hmm. It was another musical driven film with an all black cast. Okay. So of course they're like, well, we're not going to pay for another big movie with an all-black cast. Uh, yeah. 
ultimately, there was a film version done in 2006, completely different screenplay. It was written and directed by Bill Condon, who had just a few years earlier written the screenplay for Chicago, which won mm-hmm. the Academy Award. Mm-hmm. And that gave him enough pull to get money. And at the time, was $85 million budget was the highest budget ever given to a film with an all-black cast, I think, until Black Panther. Okay. So Dreamgirls, again, it's a plot that very much overlaps with Sparkle. Because mm-hmm. they're both based on the Supremes. Right. Which the writers of the play admit was an influence on them. Mm-hmm. So I know you did check out Dreamgirls. I did. What'd you think of it? I'm sorry, Joel. <laughs> this is so much better than Sparkle. Just the emotional beats and the way the story unfolds is just so much better. Oh, my God. Like, <laughs> Remember, he didn't direct Sparkle. I know he wrote it. But it was his first script. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the romance <laughs> elements here are a lot yeah. better. No, I'm not going to just sit here and bash Sparkle. Yeah, yeah. But it's a very, very good film. I mean, it's almost a no-brainer to take the influence of Motown music and turn it into a musical. And I like that it's not a jukebox musical. You know, this is all original songs, but yeah. evoking that time and feel and place. And Jennifer Hudson... She deserves that Oscar so much. Just fantastic. That song in the middle of the film, she had me in tears. Yes. Just so good. It's so good. I mean, everybody in this, it's really fun to hear Eddie Murphy sing again. (laughs) Oh, well, and even his his performance is just, Right, very good. I know. Jamie Foxx didn't get to sing as much, but when he finally does bring it, he's really good. But he's such a bastard. (laughs) Beyonce's performance is great. Anika Nani Rose. I mean, everyone in this cast is just fantastic. The songs are great. I love... We only get two little quick scenes of the Jackson 5. But they get a full musical number and then a callback on the credits. (laughs) Right. And it's not ABC, but it's very similar. And it's Mm -hmm. all the little touches and winks. And yeah, I'm really, really glad I watched it. And this gave me a reason to finally watch it. It is an excellent movie. Yeah. I wish we got a sequel since the Jamie Foxx character is based on Barry Gordy of Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. (laughs) And I want a musical sequel just exploring the production of that. (laughs) But no, it's a wonderful film. It is Mm -hmm. one of the classics of the 2000s. It's great that this came out of Chicago because Chicago was also a great movie of the Mm -hmm. 2000s, which I just watched for the first time. It's a wonderful movie, and I would be very curious to see what Joel's... Joel's would have been a very different movie. Probably, yeah, sure. I think a much leaner, more tightly focused movie. Mm -hmm. I think this film, it's just they had the budget to just go big. Yeah. Opulent sets and choreography, the way it's shot and edited. Mm -hmm. They just went all out with this movie. And I don't see Joel Schumacher in 1998 getting the same freedom to do that. You're probably correct. It would have been very interesting to see what, say, Don Cheadle would have been like in the Jamie Foxx role. Yeah. I believe Lauren Hill was going to be playing the Beyonce role. And then okay. I'm trying to remember there was another R&B singer who was in talks to do what would be the Jennifer Hudson role. Mm. But I can't remember who and I couldn't find her name in any of the articles that I redug up here. Okay. But I know it's a tricky film to sell to a studio, especially if you want to go big with it, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate. I think it's definitely much easier as we've gotten into the modern day but yeah i think my only issue is i love when they're recreating the stage songs but then the actual songs that kick in when they're having a dramatic scene do Mm -hmm. just have that kind of musical thing of like it's this dramatic scene and then suddenly someone sings (laughs) (laughs) and then everyone else starts singing it's a very late 70s early 80s style broadway musical technique sure when they're Doing throwbacks to the old Motown stuff, that's great. Mm -hmm. But when they're doing the kind of more dramatic songs, it does feel a bit more like Memories or Jesus Christ Superstar or stuff like that. And not in a terrible way, Mm -hmm. but it does feel a little different. It stands out. Right. And I would say it is similar to Sparkle. And I don't think it's necessarily a flaw in either one. But you have a little moments like toward the beginning, like, who is the lead in this film? Which I can imagine is very baffling for a studio. Especially since Jennifer Hudson got supporting actress when I would argue she is the lead. In the movie. Yeah, it's, it's almost like you can't really call her or Beyonce the yeah. lead at all. You know, like there's no lead. Well, and Beyonce doesn't even really kick in until the second half anyways. Or they're co-leads. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. I mean, I'd almost say Jamie Foxx is like the dark lead of the story (laughs) because he's the one who kind of like holds everything together. The one thing I will say in the climax when, you know, he finally figures out, oh, that's my kid. So he comes down and I'm like, well, no wonder she's crying. This strange man is hovering over her right now. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was a little odd. I was like expecting Jennifer Hudson to like throw the mic at his head or something like that. <laughs> but you know, it's like, yeah, okay. It's a wonderful movie. Yes. And I don't believe that Joel would have made a film that's this good, mm. but I would still be curious to see. And, and it doesn't help that he would have had a completely different script, completely different take on the story. Right. The costumes would have still been fantastic, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, God. You know. Joel Schumacher getting to actually direct like classic Motown numbers. Mm -hmm. That would have been great. I'm glad we have the film we do. I'm bummed that I don't get to see what his would have been like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's one of those interesting ones. And then finally, we have Life or Something Like It. Not much to the history of this one. It was just a script that floated around Hollywood for a little while, went through some rewrites. Joel was only briefly attached to it for a couple of months and was trying to push for Renee Zellweger to get mm. the lead role. And I believe this was before Bridget Jones's Diary. Okay. Yeah. And this would have been after Jerry Maguire. Okay. But yeah, she didn't do Bridget Jones's Diary until the early 2000s. So this was when she still hadn't fully caught on. This was like Nurse Betty and me, myself and Irene. <laughs> And he wanted her, but the studio didn't think that she was bankable enough. He ultimately walked. So the film was ultimately made in 2002 with Angelina Jolie starring, and it was directed by Stephen Herrick, who, are you familiar with Stephen Herrick at all? Uh, maybe if you tell me what he's done, not by name. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he directed that and The Mighty Ducks and some other films in okay. the 90s and 2000s. He's consistently been a director. He does a lot of TV now. Came out of the mm. music video scene. So there's not much to go on. I know that the script that they ultimately filmed was pretty much the script that Joel had signed on for, too. It had already gone mm -hmm. through a number of the rewrites. It's this kind of vapid local news reporter who wants to get one of the big network jobs. While doing man-on-the-street interviews, runs into Tony Shalhoub as a homeless prophet <laughs> who makes a series of predictions, including, and by the way, you're going to die next week. And so it's her, like, you know, brushing it off. But then as she realizes all these other predictions are coming true, starts mm -hmm. to realize, oh, I might die next week, which is also when I'm up to get the big job and going through this whole existential crisis of what has my life been? Who do I want to be? Is this how I want people to remember me when I die? And starts having a romance with Edward Burns, who is her cameraman, who is also her ex who she hates. <laughs> it's definitely a very typical rom-com. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, finding out he has a kid and then spending a day with him and the kid and learning how to eat ice cream and how to appreciate music and fun at the fair. Mm -hmm. Yet it's a little sharper, a little more thematic. It does get into some of the weightier existentialism of mm -hmm. I might die next week. How do I want people to remember me when I go out? It's not a bad movie. It's a perfectly fine movie. There's nothing great about it. There's nothing particularly complex about it, but there's also nothing offensive about it. And it's interesting where Angelina Jolie is playing this woman who's modeling herself after Marilyn Monroe. So she's trying to do that breathy voice and mm -hmm. has the big bleached blonde hair. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's all an act and you start to see that act peel away as she goes on. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good film and I could see Joel directing it well with mm -hmm. Renee Zellweger. It's not one that I highly recommend go track it down, but if you watch it, it's not bad. The only thing, and maybe it's just a case of the roles she's been given, but it's harder to imagine Renee Zellweger as like the beginning of the film character. You know what I mean? Like very full of herself and... Well, yeah, but that's her character in Chicago. Okay. See, I haven't seen Chicago yet, so okay. Oh, Chicago, she's the vapid okay. wannabe starlet who ends up committing murder and then becomes a celebrity as a murderer. Okay. She totally pulls that off in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I could see her doing it. So maybe the problem is the executives are thinking like me seeing her and Jerry Maguire right. up to that point of like, oh, I don't know if she can pull that off. And maybe that was why their hesitation was there. But then you look at Angelina Jolie, who was coming out of like hackers and Girl Interrupted <laughs> and all these really yeah. dark, complicated roles. And they're like, we want her for our bubbly rom-com. <laughs> Yeah. That is not an actress you think of for a bubbly rom-com. No, no. And yet she pulls it off well, and it's not, right. I don't want to say bubbly, because it does have a bite and a wit to it and a heart mm -hmm. to it that a lot of rom-coms don't have. Yeah. It's not as vapid and glossy as you would expect it to be. It is a smarter movie than you expect it to be, so it's definitely not a bad film. It's not a bad film at all. Mm -hmm. Worth checking out. And again, like one that I could totally see Joel doing a film on the same level as the film we got. Mm-hmm. 
that wraps those up. Again, we had Batman Unchained, which we brought up on our Batman and Robin episode. Nothing really new to add there. Mm -hmm. So then that brings us to our final segment on music videos. Mm -hmm. We've covered a lot of music videos through individual episodes. I think what we're going to do for the last third is anything that's like a soundtrack related music video that Joel does, we'll do on those films. But any that's just kind of its own thing, we'll save for the next wrap up episode. Makes sense. Yeah. And I do just want to throw one note is on our Falling Down episode, we covered that Lenny Kravitz Heaven Help music video video. Mm -hmm. Lenny Kravitz has since posted on his own YouTube a fully remastered version of that. Mm. So I know when we were watching it, it was like this super fuzzy version with subtitles. Yeah, very grainy. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's a really nice clean version out there. I went and watched it. It doesn't help. (laughs) (laughs) And then we only have one more music video to cover. And this was in 1999. It was by the band Bush for the song Letting the Cables Sleep. Mm -hmm. Is Bush a band that you're familiar with? Oh, yeah. I had, I don't know if that was their first album, 16 Stone, but it was definitely the first one that they got really big. And I listened to that quite a bit. I didn't get too many of the other ones after the fact, but they're certainly a band I've always listened to and enjoyed. Yeah, and I've never been hugely deep into the music scene <laughs> <laughs> like you are. So it's like yeah. I've heard of them. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I've heard this song before at one point, but it wasn't one that I could place. Yeah. Like, honestly, like I kept over the last week thinking back and it was going to be Rush. <laughs> very different I was like oh bush okay yeah <laughs> so this music video it is a bit more of a narrative video where mm-hmm. it's this guy going into a is he the lead singer of the band yes that's gavin rosdale yeah he goes into this kind of rundown building goes into a bare empty room with a woman in it they have love and i believe it's a song that talks about like let's stop leaving things unsaid and all that mm-hmm. stuff where it then intercuts between them making love while also quietly and distantly afterwards putting on their clothing she leaves and then he just sits there silently and then suddenly his shirt is off and he's hand painting the (laughs) lyrics of the songs on the walls in black and red paint that keeps mixing to look like blood and then later he sees her walking down the street with i believe her pimp who is the guy we saw playing the guitar as he walked in and he goes up to try to talk to her but she can't speak because she's deaf and speaks in sign language and is then pulled away by the pimp and he never sees her again I feel like you're making decisions on there on the pimp aspect of it. There's no money ever exchanging hands. I say it's definitely an arrangement where it's you go in this room, you have sex with this woman. It's an anonymity thing. And he's there at the beginning and end with her. Well, apparently he's signing. Why didn't you call me Uh, hmm. to her? So I guess I feel like it's not necessarily a case that she's a prostitute. But I do think it is an anonymous sex arrangement where you go into this room, you meet this woman, and you both go your separate ways. I feel like you're being too literal. Uh... To me, like, okay, I'll say this. I liked this video up until the reveal that she was deaf. Okay. Oh, to be fair, I like the video. Yeah, no, I do. I'm talking about the story. I really love from the moment where you see their hands almost touch is just really nice and says a whole lot emotionally. Mm -hmm. It fits the emotion of the song very well. I love the juxtaposition of the steamy, sexy moments with the very awkward getting dressed Mm -hmm. and dealing with the after effects. There's no doubt they were cashing in on the fact that Rosdale was very much a sex symbol at this point Mm -hmm. with the whole thing of him naked. But even the choices of the paint being the black and the red and the red kind of gives you this sort of image of blood. Yeah, the way they run together. Yeah, it's really, really, really good. And it because, like I said, the lyrics are stressing, you know, we need to talk this over. We need to deal with our problems. Mm -hmm. We can't just be quiet about it. I think it's all expressing that really well. And then it's got to have this like cute little, oh, the reason they're not talking is because she's deaf. I, yeah. We don't need that. We don't need that at all. So yeah, to me, I honestly felt that was her boyfriend. I don't know how you wouldn't know that the woman you're meeting up with is deaf, but it was an extramarital affair and awkward. And then she's leaving and she doesn't know how to tell him, oh, I'm actually with somebody else. I wasn't taking it that literally. I was thinking it was more a representation of being in an affair or not talking about things. And it just happens to be, you know, an artistic representation, but with the empty room and the so on and so forth. 
I mean, the painting lyrics on the wall, I, I took that as very much an artistic flourish, but I, I just sure. read into it literally because I watched the video several times and it was mm-hmm. like, not until I think the third time that I clicked that the guy that she was with at the end was the guy who was just sitting out in the lobby playing the guitar who shares a look with him as he walks into the room. Okay. And if he doesn't know she's deaf, then that means that this is an anonymous encounter with someone that he has never met before. Yeah. I guess it could be. It's just that then it all becomes too literal, right? Because of course you're not going to have an emotional connection with a prostitute necessarily. That's not what you're there for. I just feel like if you should just cut that part out of this whole story. But again, it's like this is also coming off of the Lenny Kravitz videos where he falls in love with the (laughs) seeming prostitute who lives across the way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate because everything else but that is really, really strong. Yeah. And really, really well shot. And it's matching the emotion of the song so perfectly. And then you kind of spoil it with that. Yeah. And Joel doesn't really do that main narrative music videos because even like that right. Heaven Help one, while it had a story, it was very stylistic, very impressionistic. Mm-hmm. I think this one is probably his most narrative. Yes. Of the ones we've seen so far, for sure. Well, and I think it's because they keep the focus down. And even when it gets mm-hmm. into the artistic flourishes with him painting the lyrics on the walls, it feels like he's had this encounter with someone and now it's done, but he's still thinking about it and he's pouring mm-hmm. his emotions, impression on the wall through the lyrics. Right. I actually really do like the music video. I think, yeah, the mm-hmm. whole sign language twist at the end is stupid. Mm-hmm. But I think it is a well-directed music video. I like, again, the way that it slowly leads in, this moment between these two people, the way they mm-hmm. counterpoint the intimacy of the sex with the awkwardness afterwards. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of if you even just left off the epilogue mm-hmm. and it just ends with him alone in a room again. Right. And even because there's a moment where she's sitting at a chair at a window. By a window, yeah. If you just take that as, you know, they're both alone at that moment, that works, right? Because then they have the steamy encounter, then they have the awkwardness, and then they have loneliness. Yeah. That works. That works perfectly. They had an opportunity to connect, Mm -hmm. and they missed that opportunity. Right. That's all you really need. Mm -hmm. But even then, I like the way that it's directed. I like the way it's shot. Yeah. Again, it's like this coming out right around the time of 8mm. This Mm -hmm. had that allure of pulling you into this underworld situation, which is kind of seedy, but also alluring. Mm -hmm. And then also just the emotions of it, emotions of the experience of it that I felt the movie 8mm kind of lacked in the flatness with how it was directed. Yeah. If 8mm had been done in the style of this video, which isn't even that different of a style, it just had more energy to it and more focus on the emotion and the and the experience of it. Mm-hmm. I think 8mm would have just miles better than it is just mm-hmm. through that little shift. Yeah. So it is a very interesting video. Mm-hmm. I did enjoy it. Yep. It's actually, I want to say it's probably my favorite of the music videos we've gotten so far. Yeah, I agree. It's just one misstep at the end, but otherwise exactly. it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, Lost in the Shadows is fun for an entirely different reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's like also one of my favorites. That's the Lost Boys one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where they're all in the train car. Mm-hmm. It's just pure pizzazz. Yeah. But no, this one was, I, I really enjoyed it. I know we have at least two or three more music videos in the 2000s. Mm. He does wind down. Yeah. I guess wrapping up this episode. So what do you look forward to in the final stretch? Well, I've never seen Phone Booth, Mm -hmm. so that's one I'm definitely... And the number 23, too. That one is like, I was interested in it at the time Mm -hmm. it came out, but for whatever reason, never saw it. I'm looking forward to experiencing the Phantom of the Opera for the first time. And then, of course, in typical Joel fashion, there's also ones I've never even heard of and I'm not familiar with at all. So it's like, hmm, maybe there'll be some strong ones in that, too. Who knows? So yeah, we're getting away from the ones I'm familiar with, but in a way that's kind of exciting because like I said, I don't know what's going to be a strong and what's going to be a dud, but we'll find out. And what do you hope for from Joel? Definitely getting some of his spirit back for sure. Like I said, I think we saw a little decline there post Batman and Robin. I mean, I guess, you know, since the music video was done afterward as well, Mm -hmm. obviously that's a much shorter form, but we're definitely seeing a lot of emotion and flair there. So hopefully he'll also be bringing that back into his films as well. Yeah. And I hope so too. I think again, like eight millimeter was such a swing in the opposite direction that he has to kind of settle back in. Mm -hmm. I think even by the time we got to flawless i think his direction had regained an energy and momentum even if the material it was directing wasn't the strongest Mm -hmm. 
going into this decade, I've only seen Phone Booth and Trapped. Okay. And his two House of Cards episodes, and that's it. I haven't mm-hmm. seen anything else. <laughs> haven't seen Family Opera. Haven't seen Bad Company. Like, I'm curious to see, like, how does he do in a Michael Bay-style buddy action movie? Mm-hmm. How does he do with number 23? <laughs> how does he do with Phantom of the Opera? I know a lot of people have very mixed feelings on Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Yeah. Some people love that movie and some people loathe that movie. <laughs> so I'm fascinated. And again, like we ran into that with the Batman movies where it's like, this didn't work and I can see why you don't like it, but I don't mm-hmm. hate it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much all of his films, with the exception of Phantom of the Opera, are mm-hmm. going to be smaller, leaner films. Yeah. Is he able to do that smaller, leanerness while still having the energy and the focus on character mm-hmm. that we know he's capable of? Yeah. I guess there's also, since we're going to be looking at a lot of the Lost Boys follow-ups and would-be sequels and so forth, that's going to be really fun to see where people try to take that universe, because there's definitely a lot to explore there. And then, yeah, just to let people know, following this episode, we're going to do two looks at two unproduced screenplays that Joel Schumacher was going to do a sequel and a prequel throughout the 90s, Mm -hmm. and then actually look at those direct-to-video sequels that were made, plus all the comic books. Mm -hmm. I think the ones I'm most excited to check out are those Vertigo comics. Yeah. Just because they put the saxophonist on the cover of one (laughs) issue. He is on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Don't know that he's going to have much of a part, but... He better. He's at least there. (laughs) He better. (laughs) Don't get your hopes up too high. (laughs) This Vertigo comic is for mature readers only for sexual situations. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) I still believe. Just cut off the episode right there. Just, (laughs) we're done. I walked away. (laughs) So following the credits... Most of this project has been, I haven't seen most of this stuff, and I'm curious. Yeah. You don't hear much talk about the films he's made in the 2000s. No. I think with the exceptions of Phone Booth and Phantom of the Opera. Right. But I'm curious to see what are these other ones. Like, I've never seen Tigerland, and I'm curious Mm -hmm. to see him do a war movie. Right. I'm curious to see these. Oh, that one's set in Louisiana, too. Cool. Oh, is it? Okay. (laughs) I thought it was going to be like Korea or Vietnam or something. No. um, I'm guessing it's at a training camp. Yes. Based in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Interesting. So we'll see how he does in Louisiana again. (laughs) Yep. Remember in the client, like, because I'm editing that episode now, (laughs) how his idea of staging Memphis was put in as many Elvis Presley references as he could. (laughs) Yeah. It's the Elvis Presley Memorial Wing of the Hospital with an Elvis Presley impersonator. Right. And the hitman with Elvis Pesley. Uh, Joel Schumacher. <laughs> As we got through the 70s, it was interesting seeing the early steps. As we got through the 80s, it was fascinating seeing him really establish himself as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And that made me really excited for where we would go. And the 90s has me a little bit more... I know there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. Sure. I think this is where we really see the inconsistency of Joel's career. Mm -hmm. And really, honestly, one other thing I did just want to throw in there on just the only real note I know on a personal level is I've said in the previously we're in the second half of the 90s is actually when he finally went fully sober, Mm -hmm. like he quit alcohol. That was actually in the early 90s. So closer around to the era of coming out of 2000 Malibu Road. Okay. So most of this was him post sobriety. So he again was putting a lot more focus on work and friendships. And again, like even after Batman and Robin was, I just need to take a break. Yeah. And so from then on, he's been completely sober. And so I'm not saying that as like, a, oh, yeah, we can blame it on the booze because that doesn't line up with anything. <laughs> right. Just on a personal note, that's, I think, really respectful that for over 25 years now, he's been completely drug and alcohol free. Sure. The 2000s is where he also becomes a regular fixture in documentaries. Mm. Documentaries about Michael Jackson and Diana Ross and New York in the 70s, gay culture, the fashion culture. I actually just recently watched Halston, a documentary that he was in about the fashion designer Halston, who he worked with in the 60s. Mm. Like one of them I'm fascinated is a comedy called Heckler about people who have been mocked relentlessly. Oh. And just to get his perspective on that. Sure. Yeah. There's been some interesting think pieces that have been put out about like reevaluating the Batman movies and all that. And one that really pointed out is the Batman movies of Joel Schumacher very much overlap with the rise of Ain't It Cool News and that style of internet culture and discourse. Mm -hmm. And Joel was one of the first early fixtures of mocking from that community. Yeah, sure. It's definitely something we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add before we bring things to a close? I don't think so. 
Okay, and that is going to wrap up our 1990s decade recap of Schumacast. Good night, Angie. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.